Hello friends, I am back with part 13 of a video series that I am doing on a very excellent book entitled Be Not Deceived by Roger Curtis. And um, I was sh uh, Roger was sharing some thoughts with me recently and um, he was saying that even though he did write this book, that this book was the inspiration of some very wonderful mentors and teachers of his that the Lord had brought into his life during his early walk with the Lord and he said that this book is the rephrasing of many of these wonderful holy men of God that were um, Rogers mentors and he wanted to make sure that these men received uh, proper credit um, for this book and um, he does mention the names of these men in his introduction and one of the one of these holy men's name was Paris Reedhead, and Paris was um, an excellent preacher. And his his most famous sermon was called Ten Shackles and a Shirt," which every Christian should hear. It's a wonderful sermon, and it's available online to listen to. Um, another uh, mentor of Rogers was Harry Kahn, who was a theologian in his own right. Um, he also credits Gordon Olson who he had never met personally, but, but Gordon wrote an excellent writing called The Truth Will Make You Free, which truly inspired Roger. He also credits Dave Koch as one of his members, a personal friend and Bible teacher, and his, his special personal pastor, Reverend Dean Harvey. And lastly, he credits a man named Victor Brown, who was a co-worker and missionary um, who preached and taught in Mexico. So it's, it's truly wonderful that that um, Roger was so blessed by such holy men of God and um, he wanted to give proper credit to these men. And anyways, we are on chapter 13 now which deals with sanctification and, and this is a, a very good chapter because um, a lot of times when we think of the word sanctification we get confused and, and we've heard different things about it. but. I like this chapter because Roger simplifies it and he makes it simple to understand. Um, he says the word sanctified um, and the word holy come from the same Greek word hagios. So in other words, um, sanctified and holy are basically synonymous words. They both mean clean, pure, chaste, and perfect basically. Um, so whenever we think of the word sanctified, we can just think of the word holy, more or less. As it tells us in Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament words, it reads, Sanctification is used in the New Testament as a separation of the believer from evil things and ways. This sanctification is God's will for the believer and his purpose in calling him by the gospel. It must be learned from God, not imputed, as God teaches it by his word and it must be pursued by the believer earnestly and undeviatingly. Holy character cannot be transferred or imputed. It is an individual possession built up little by little as a result of obedience to the word of God and of following the example of Christ. Um, John Wesley noticed a great discrepancy in the lifestyles of those who pro profess to be believers some were obedient while others were only partial in obedience and still others were completely indifferent to the commandments of God. John Wesley came up with a dangerous teaching because of this and he called it the second work of grace. Um, the charismatic church has taken this one step farther and called it baptism of the Holy Spirit. The general idea is that a person can be saved and then at a later date receive sanctification or the baptism of the Spirit. And at that time we'll have the power from the Holy Ghost to obey fully the commandments of God and will be a candidate for the spiritual gifts. The problem with this is that it presents two kinds of Christians and that is a, it's very dangerous when we think that there are two kinds of Christians because the Bible only presents one kind of Christian one that is obedient, one that is obedient. That's the only kind of Christian there is. There's not two kinds of Christians, one obedient and one disobedient. So, um, but 
This, this teaching presents two kinds of Christians, one obedient and the other disobedient or only partially obedient, one being worldly and the other one conforming to the prescribed laws of Jesus or the prescribed laws of God. Jesus taught that if you love him, you will be obedient. When we look at John 14, 15, the apostle, the apostle John in his first epistle to the church said, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So it's so important that we don't get deceived and think that there's two kinds of Christians, one disobedient and one not. There's only one. And that's an obedient Christian who walks with the Lord. Um, so, and, but as we, um, instead, we must realize this, that it is plain from Scripture that the new believer receives the Spirit at the time of his initial conversion. When we look at uh, Acts 2.38, we can see this. It tells us clearly, and there's other Scripture that also indicates this. Um, but the important thing here is that the new believer has started on a journey, is a walk, which will take him by growing through the Spirit's leading to be increasingly mature and pleasing to God. For as it tells us in Peter 2.2, 2, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, it says, Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. So it's... God leaves it up to us if we're going to continue to follow him or are we going to fall away. Um, you know, it's like in the parable of the sower. We can keep growing, but we must be nourished by the word of God. We must keep praying. We must keep walking with him or we will die. It's as simple as that. Um, and, and, and as it says in 1 Peter, we have to grow. We have to thirst for the word of God if we are truly sincere Christians. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, we are told to be filled with the Spirit. When examining the Greek grammar, it becomes clear that the case of the verb filled is something that started in the past and is continuing on into the future. From the time of our new birth, we have become the temple of God by His Holy Spirit dwelling within us. But with a new believer, his capacity is still small, and he can only absorb, absorb a small amount of God's great power that is available through the indwelling spirit. But as he grows in humility, grace, and knowledge, more of that power of the spirit is available and usable to him. The victory that the Bible assures us of is only available through the indwelling spirit. And the more we learn how to use that power, to resist sin and the more the more power of that the power of the spirit will make available to us is progressive so it's imperative that that we as Christians um, God gives us his spirit but he demands us to walk in it we have to abide in him we have to grow or else we're going to die as Christians we're going to die as believers Temptation to sin will never completely disappear in this world, for Satan will always attempt to destroy the person who has chosen to walk with Christ. That's his job. He came to destroy, and the, he he came to destroy. And the closer we are to God, the more violently he will attack. But also have hope, for the closer we are to God, the more assured we are of the victory over the devil. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What encouraging words. 1 John 4.4 4. Gordon Olson said, Continual deliverance, being continually, you know, walking with the Lord, continual deliverance depends, apart, depends upon our having learned the secret of continual abiding in Christ and therefore is not automatic. The longer we practice the prescription provided, the easier and more sensitive we become to recognizing potential challenges and taking countermeasures of obedience and climaxes of faith to maintain spiritual stability. That was by Gordon Olson. Abiding in Christ 
can be compared to an airplane in flight. As long as the motors or source of power, which is the Holy Spirit, continues to pull us forward, the flight continues. But if the motor should stop, we fall. So in other words, if we decide to, to fall into the temptation of sin or we get complacent in our walk with God, we're not going to be guided by the Holy Spirit any further. Holy Spirit is Christ's Spirit guiding us. Such is the great importance of the Spirit's dynamic power and influence governing our lives. Without Him we fall. And as the Bible tells us, without Him, without Christ, we can do nothing. And the Holy Spirit is Christ's Spirit abiding in us. But if we fall back into sin or complacency or denial, things such as that, as it tells us in the Bible, sin separates us from Christ. So we need to know the secret of continual abiding in Christ, and we will be continually sanctified, continually holy. As the Apostle Paul said in um, Philippians chapter 3, he said, Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I, I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. How wonderful that the Lord our God is a God that tries the motives behind our choices. And as long as our motives are pure, he attributes this to us as being holy. Our actions may not be perfect, but our motives behind them must be pure. Our goal is, get, is to get to the place where we are no longer children tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine. But speaking the truth in love, we grow up in all respects into him who is the head, even Christ. That's Ephesians 4, 14 through 15. This is a wonderful chapter because um, to me what it shares is that um, there, there's a deception in our day that tells us that there are two kinds of Christians. And there are not two kinds of Christians. There is one one that keeps a heart that's pure and true. And the other and the other claims to be a Christian, but he's not walking with the Lord. He's not thirsting for the Word of God. So if if we see that in our lives, we have to test ourselves. We have to make sure we're truly of the faith and make sure we truly have a sanctified life that walks with God. So what an excellent chapter. Next, we will be heading into part 14, which deals with spiritual gifts. And this is a very excellent chapter as well. Thank you for listening.